You're listening to That Gratitude Guy podcast with David George Brooke. That Gratitude Guy. Learn about how gratitude turns what you have into enough through stories of motivation and inspiration. Wherever you are in your life and whatever you're going through, That Gratitude Guy is here to help you achieve great things and live a happier, healthier life. Change the way you live today right here with David George Brooke, That Gratitude Guy, starting now. Well, hi, everyone. Welcome to That Gratitude Guy podcast. I'm David George Brooke, That Gratitude Guy, your host, where my mission is to have guests that relate and recall moments of their life that were propelled and energized by utilizing the power of a gratitude mindset. You can expect to get some tips and takeaways from each of my special guests. My podcast is downloaded every Tuesday morning at 5 a.m. on the Transformation Talk Radio Network and is available on Apple, Google, and Spotify. Please subscribe and give me a five-star rating if you like what you hear or see. I always appreciate that. And also, I do gratitude keynote speaking and gratitude coaching, and you can reach me at thatgratitudeguy.com or email at david at thatgratitudeguy.com as well. So let me get on to the favorite part of my show, which is my guest, which is always my highlight. And no exception today, nice young lady you'll be hearing from in a second. Let me tell you a little about my guest, Lauren Broyer. Lauren is an award-winning inspirational speaker and transformational coach certified through the Brave Thinking Institute. She works with organizations and individuals, helping them build their dreams, accelerate their results, and create richer, more fulfilling lives. Faced with devastating news, Lauren had a choice, rebuild her life from the ground up in a way she would love or stay with the status quo. Taking the road less travel, she decided to live her dream. Lauren founded Soul Savvy to help others connect with the most infinite side of themselves so they can live a life that they love. Out of, 300, uh, out of 3,500 rather eligible coaches, Lauren won the Outstanding Impact Award for 2021 from the Brave Thinking Institute, recognizing her impact on clients and her reach in the industry. Lauren lives in the San Francisco Bay Area with the love of her life, Cameron, and their cat, Little. She loves the beach, country music, and lots of laughs with good friends, especially over cocktails. She starts and ends every day with a gratitude practice. I love to hear that. And is so thankful for her amazing life. Lauren, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. It's such a pleasure to be here with you. You bet. You bet. And I always start with the context to tell the listeners and viewers, how did you and I meet? That's a great question. So we have a mutual acquaintance, Faith, who connected us after she watched me do a workshop. And she said, you need to connect with David because you'd be fabulous on his podcast. So let's hope her prophecy comes true here today. (laughs) I think so. And then too, when I was thinking about the Brave Thinking Institute, which we'll talk about as well, I believe another connection was Chris Yee. I yes, think Chris well. e. that's right because of that. So, so walk us back a little bit. And I tell people there's the old thing, there's the 10 cent tour, or the 10 cent update, or there's the $5 one, not the $5 one, but talk about sort of past college. And when you kind of got started a little bit about the Lauren journey, once you were out of college and out into the world. Yeah, well, I graduated from San Francisco State University, go Gators. And I became a teacher and I became a classroom teacher and found a lot of fulfillment out of working with young people, helping them to become more of who they they wanted to be. And um, there came a time in my life, though, that that didn't feel so fulfilling anymore. Mm. And I wanted more and I wanted to feel like I was making even more of an impact, but I wasn't sure how to do that. And I had a lot of fear around maybe losing the good I had built. Hmm. Around the same time in my life, pretty much actually through my whole elementary teaching career, I'd met a guy and we got married and then that kind of fell apart too. So I came to a point in my life, I'm feeling unfulfilled in my job. My marriage is falling apart. Where do you go? Mm-hmm. And what I've learned is people usually go one of two places. They stay in that uh, pattern of drama, struggle, chaos, mostly because we don't have the tools We don't know any better if that's what we learned, or you can actually decide that it's a defining moment and you can catapult yourself forward. So that is what I did. And and just to jump in there, Lauren, I think you mentioned not having the tools, which I think makes a lot of sense, but something else I'm fascinated with, I think we could almost do a whole show on this is just fear and people that don't want to change and whether it's a relationship you mentioned getting in a bad relationship and then you got out of that and into one now with Cameron and everything is great and so forth but I I really wonder how do we attack fear because I think that's such a big factor whether it's relationships or our career or whatever absolutely well the the reason that fear can be such a player in killing our dreams basically is that most people don't understand the nature of fear 
Mm -hmm. They think fear is a stop sign. It's a sign. Oh, I shouldn't do it. Oh, look, I'm feeling afraid. I shouldn't do it. More often than not, the fear is just a sign that what you're doing is worth it. Mm. And so what happens is our nervous system is programmed to alert us to two things, potential danger and the unknown. So what does that mean? Every single time I'm doing something new, I am going to feel fear. So it was Eleanor Roosevelt who said, do one thing every day that scares you. Mm, I like that. Because she understood this concept that fear is not a stop sign or a boogeyman. It's actually a very good sign that you're on the border of something new, something different, growth. And so I think not knowing the nature of fear is one of the number one things that hold us back because we feel that fear and it's so uncomfortable and it's that scary nervous system reaction that we stop ourselves. And that's why most of us keep living the same life over and over again. And Lauren, can you break it? Can you break something down? I mean, I, I'm such a list person. I've always thought when people come to me, I have a big problem. And I said, and they just want to whine and go on about it. And I said, wait, 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 wait. Let, let me get a pad of paper. Let me get a pen. Let's take, let's make some notes here and let's put some steps together that we can get you out of this mess that you're in or whatever. And you mentioned a huge life-changing event for you as well. But are there steps involved? Because I'm really fascinated with the fear piece because I think that's so common. Are there what you could break it down into a couple of steps that a person might want to go through as they're sort of facing this fear head on? Sure. So the first thing that I would ask them is, is what's on the other side of this fear something that you're in love with? Mm. Not the journey. The, the journey is always bumpy most of the time, right? So what people, what holds them back is because the journey is going to be uncomfortable, they forget about the outcome. So the first thing is on the other side of fear, this thing you're thinking about doing, would you love that? If I, have, if I had had that question for myself when I was teaching and thinking about starting a new career, I would ask myself, I would have asked myself, wait a second, Lauren, if this all worked out and the journey worked and it was easy, would you love a new career? Mm. And I would have said, yes. Okay, good. That means that the fear is simply just a sign I'm doing something new. It's not there to stop me. Mm -hmm. The second step is to then I use what I call the fear speech and I'll give it to you. It's, it's, it's a four sentence speech. I say to myself every time I'm feeling fear. Oh, cool. If, if there's something on the other side that I would love. So there's something on the other side of fear that I would love. And so I say this fear. Thank you for showing up today. Your presence is proof. I'm on my growing edge. Hmm. Third sentence, all those things you're warning me about. If they come, I'll overcome. Mm. And then the final sentence is, bye for now. See you tomorrow. I like that. Now, how did you, that's really cool. How'd you develop that? So the energetics of that is I wanted to really give my nervous system and my subconscious mind a reminder of what fear really is. Mm -hmm. So the first sentence, fear, thank you for showing up today. Mm -hmm. As soon as you say thank you to this thing that seems scary, it loses its power. Right. It's like if a schoolyard bully comes up to you and says something to you and you say, wow, thank you. Mm -hmm. well, we just yeah. took all their power away, didn't we? That's right. That's so right. So that would be the reason for the first sentence. The second sentence is reminding me, oh yeah, fear is only going to show up when I'm growing, when I'm doing something new, when I'm going out of my comfort zone. Right. The third sentence, if all the things you're warning me about come, I'll overcome. Mm -hmm. It's a reminder that I've survived 100% of my hard days so far. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's like, I've gotten through all the, all the hard things so far. So why should these possible hard circumstances scare me? Right. And then bye for now. See you tomorrow. Just kind of sounds like a cute, like get out of here. But the reason I say, see you tomorrow is because I want fear to come back tomorrow because again, it'll mean I'm growing. It'll mean right. I'm doing things that are worth it. Right. And I think that fear equals growing uh, the presence of it is, is maybe something that a lot of people miss. Because they're this, they want, oh, I just can't be afraid. I don't want to be afraid. I want to, and that's why I think both in relationships and maybe careers is maybe more than anything else where I see fear. People are so afraid of what's going to be on the other side. And as you said, what's on the other side, what would you love on the other side? Instead of looking at it as just some blind walking down some dark alley or something, yeah. it's like, what's on the other side that I really would love. In fact, using you as, as kind of the guinea pig, when you talked about San Francisco state and then the not in the classroom teacher, not so fulfilling. When I think of teaching, it's such a great profession, such a noble profession. What was it about that that made it not fulfilling for you at some point? A um, couple different things. I think one, just the, 
inability to ever make a livable income. Mm -hmm. So feeling like you're pouring your life and soul into something. And I had gotten myself into a situation where I had the student loan debt and the credit card debt. And when I looked at the salary scale, which shows what you're going to get from year one to year 30, and of course there'll be increases over time. Right. I realized I'm not even going to break even and I'm going to be retired. And I will have spent 30 years struggling. Wow. And that was so devastating to me. Mm -hmm. And I felt like I was pouring my heart and soul into change, into kids, into things I believed in, and to feel like there was no financial compensation. There was no way for me to really survive in the San Francisco Bay Area with that mm -hmm. salary, um, not in the trouble I'd gotten myself into. Um, yeah. That was hard. But the second thing is, when I was working with kids, I came ac across this um, thought like, I don't really care about geometry. I want to teach them how to be good people. I want to teach mm. them how to believe in themselves. I'm, I'm, and of course I was doing some of that. And I felt a little bit stifled by what I had to teach versus what I, in my core values thought would have been more important. I would have spent my whole day just teaching <laughs> morals, ethics, how to move forward, how to know yourself, how to discover yourself, how to believe in yourself. And that was where I started to rub up against feeling out of alignment with myself, if that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. And I think I remember that brings back some old memories when my younger son was going through school, uh, grade school, they had a curriculum night. It was either grade school or junior high. And just as a parent, but really as a student, it never occurred to me the curriculum is what the curriculum is. But I thought, why do we have to learn about geometry and geography and all these things? I want to know about life skills. I want to know how to be a good communicator. I want to know how to balance a checkbook. I want yeah. to know how to pay the bills. I mean, the basic life skills. So that's such a good point. And I can see that I think it's maybe changed, but I remember that it's my same son going through a, a financial course, but it was something that the next year got voted off and it wasn't even there anymore. And he said it was his favorite course of all the things that told them how to save money, invest, and go to put the right savings account, and so on and so forth. So, but that's interesting. And I think also never make a livable income. It's just, again, it's such a nice profession, but it doesn't in this day and age where both people usually have to work in relationships and the money is, it's inflation and all the, the expenses, expenses that we have, gosh, it just doesn't really support the average person. And that's really unfortunate because that's teaching our next generation and so on. And so it and then really is. life skills yeah. and so forth. So how did you then sort of evolve into the coaching piece? Yeah, well, that's, you know, the, dev the devastating news that you heard about in my bio um, was my, one day my husband came home from work and he was kind of pacing down the hall, looked a little bit like he'd seen a ghost. And he just came into my little den that I worked in. And he just looked at me and he said to me, I don't love you. My husband, I don't love you. And I don't think you, I want to be married to you. Wow. And then he said five words. I, I will never forget which were you're not my dream girl. Wow. And then he gave me this long list of things that uh, he thought a dream girl should have that I didn't have. And so here I am in this situation. I mean, obviously devastated, heartbroken, but also deeply reflecting of all the times that I knew that this wasn't the right relationship with for my for me. Mm. But I'd made myself wrong. I'd made it my fault. I didn't trust myself to know that. And so I felt a lot of shame and a lot of embarrassment. I had only been married a year and now I'm getting divorced. Wow. And so what ended up happening was my husband bought me out of the house because I couldn't afford it on my own. I lost my two dogs. He kept the dogs because, of course, I wouldn't have a place to keep them since I couldn't afford a home on my own. And I ended up moving back in with my parents. And I thought to myself, and I remember having this. Actually, it was I went to a... Um, workshop in Los Angeles that was about building a dream because at that point I'm like well if anybody needs a dream it's me because I'm pretty much rock bottom here and I moved back in with my parents I have all the debt this relationship has gone nowhere and listening to this um, dream builder summit in LA which was put on by the Brave Thinking Institute I'm listening to the speaker speak and I'm thinking to myself oh my gosh I was so af afraid of failing I was so afraid of embarrassing myself and starting a new career and not, you know, I was so afraid of everything. And look at this. I still failed. And it was this great awareness that you can fail at a life that you don't even enjoy living. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
I, it's like, I, I looked at the relationship I built, the job that I built. And it's like, I don't like any of this. And yet I was so afraid of changing it. So in that moment, I just decided if I'm going to fail moving forward, I want to be damn sure that I'm failing at something I absolutely love and that matters to me. And if I can fail in the life I don't want to live, what was I so afraid of? Right. right. And that was just a huge awakening for me. And that's what inspired me to want to help, especially other women. Although, of course, I have male clients too, but I just noticed how low my self-esteem was and how low my level of trust in myself was. And I thought, I never want another woman to feel this way. Exactly. And that became my mission. And I can imagine too, with, as you say, primarily female clients, maybe some males as well, but I can imagine you never want another woman to feel that way. And yet I bet you've had clients that are in exactly that situation that have gone through it. So it's, it's hard to go through it, of course, but gosh, what a great position for you to be in to help them and guide them through that type of, type of thing. And have you ever noticed that kind of a common thread that went through some of them that went through you that were maybe you were blinded by something or, or something maybe you could have looked for earlier that would have helped or no? I think the most common thread I find with both myself and my clients, whatever the transition is they're making, whether they have a wonderful life and they just want to experience and express more, or they're more like I was when I started, which is more of that rock bottom confusion place. I think the thread that has bound us all. And what I particularly like working with people with is most humans think their circumstances dictate their results. Mm -hmm. And really it has nothing to do with circumstances. And the way we know it has nothing to do with circumstances is you can look at two people who grew up in the same neighborhood with the same type of uh, parents with the same type of opportunities and they complete completely create different results. Right. So I think it's getting out of the pull of it's the circumstances, it's because of this or the economy or the COVID or, and getting yourself into that there's a power inside of each one of us and the ability to think different thoughts and shift your mindset and shift perception and think differently about yourself is really the key, no matter what the circumstance. And so you I know, think, I, oh, well, go ahead. No, please. Uh, I was thinking circumstances dictate your results. And I'm a big fan of taking notes and lists and all that kind of thing and bullet points. And here's some tips and some great tips for Lauren or what have you. So when somebody wants to do something different, not that the circumstances dictate results, because like identical twins and, and one goes up and one goes down or what have you, how would you sort of advise that, that person you're coaching about how to really make sure they're going through the right steps, if you will, so they are going to get where they want. And it's not just them being the victim of their circumstances. Yeah, the first thing is to start looking at things in their life. So um, anytime we feel longing or discontent in our life, so anytime we feel, oh, I'd love to do that, or, oh, I wish it was this, the key is to not pitch a tent in that feeling, but to recognize it because that's usually a soul signal, I like to call it, if that's a little too woo-woo for your listeners, it's a sign and a signal for growth. Mm. And so when I sit and when I'm going, wow, I really am starting to feel unfulfilled with teaching instead of shoving that down, which is sometimes what people do, like, let's just shove it down and ignore that feeling or living in it. I'm so unfulfilled. I'm so unfulfilled. It's actually taking it and going, OK, if this if I had a magic wand and I could transform this circumstance right here, right now, what would it look like? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's when you shift yourself into leaning into possibility. Because when you start to say, well, what could go right? What would it look like? If it were working and I could just snap my fingers, what would it be? You really start to get to know yourself. Yeah. And when you know yourself, you can start making some different, more empowered decisions. So I, I'm a big advocate. And I think anybody who uh, does this type of work, it, especially like Chris Yee and myself and others in the Brave Thinking Institute and other life coaches, very important to have a vision for where you'd love to go. Mm-hmm. To have a vision for what would life look like if it were working, and for those pe for those people who are really scared or tend to be fearful, like I was, that question can sometimes paralyze us because we go, yeah. "Well, I don't know," or "I know what I'd love, but I can't do it." So you just want to tell your nervous system, "I'm not saying we're doing this. We're right. just playing dress up. Let's just play dress up, and if we don't mm -hmm. like it, we can take the costume back off." But you just play dress up with yourself, and you start exploring what would you love. Yeah. If, if this were easy, if this were working. And I also think it's neat sometimes too, I think back about uh, parts of my life, 
sometimes it's important to know maybe not what I, where I wanted to go, but I definitely knew where I didn't want to go. So that eliminated a bunch of options over here. And I remember thinking, I don't want to go back to school and work the school for six years, get a law degree or this or that or whatever. And so, but having that vision is so important and being honest with yourself. And I, and I think what you look at, I use this example. It's an old used example many times, but the car skidding on ice down the icy road and they focus on the tree instead of all the open space. So what do they do? They crash into the tree instead of slide into the open space. And so it's really where our direction is. So, so again, is it, coming back and keep pushing on the little tips or reminders. So if somebody is, if they're in the, the, their longing or in their state of discontent, as you mentioned, it's a signal for growth. And then they want to get to know themselves. Again, are there steps they can kind of go through that? I mean, one of the things I talk about always write in the gratitude journal and drink lots of water and hang out with positive people and get your sleep and so on. But if they have that vision, are there sort of steps to remind them how to take to get to that vision? Well, I think it's very important. The, the number one thing that I think other than fear that will hold people back from actually living into a vision is they think they have to be able to see the whole pathway. Mm. And you're not going to see the whole pathway. Many times you'll write out a vision. I mean, when I wrote my first vision, it was nothing like the life I was living. I wrote, I'm so happy and grateful now that I'm an inspirational speaker and I help other women and I have plenty of free time and I fell in love again. And it's this great guy. There was very little inside of me that thought that that was an achievable vision. My life had shown me that that wasn't practical. Right, right. But the idea is that you write whatever's on your heart as your vision And then you just ask your higher self, God, whatever you prescribe to for one step. Right, right. One step. What step may I take today to serve this vision? Right. And you just start writing down ideas because baby steps will take you all the way up Mount Everest. Nobody said you had to leap the whole way or run the whole way. So if you're waiting to see the whole pathway, you'd never go on the journey. If I'm driving here from San Francisco to Disneyland in Los Angeles, I might be able to see the whole, the first, you know, half mile of the road, but I can't see the whole road. I know I trust it's going to be there. Right. And life is very much the same, but we don't like to not know. And I think that's why some of us go into the practicalities. It's like being a teacher. Okay. I might be broke, but at least I can see a 30 year pathway. Right. Right. But it's but if it's not fulfilling, then that wanting to see the whole pathway is really holding us back. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, I heard this int- uh, recently, Lauren, that I thought was really neat to kind of uh, give that an analogy or a way to explain it is they said it's like driving in the dark. You know, your headlines, uh, headlights only show you just enough to know that there's a curb coming up and then you're going to go straight for a while. And you don't have to see the whole road from San Francisco to Disneyland, as you said, because it could be overwhelming. And then there's the, the reverse engineering that I look at. I'm one of these with a Fitbit and I keep track of all my steps and I get 15 to 20,000 steps a day and all that kind of thing. And, and I never thought about how long I've had this, but I went to the dashboard and I've done 15 million steps. And I got to look and see how long that was. I want to say it's maybe 10 years, five years. I don't know, whatever it is. But all I know is that, but who can imagine 15 million steps? Nobody can. And as you said, you can baby step your way all the way to Mount Everest. And it doesn't have to be this one big chunk. In fact, I like to think of it as you break it, break it down into bite-sized pieces that you can handle. And of course, we've all heard that eat an elephant one piece at a time and so on. But I think it's so important. And I think the another thing that reminds me, I'm trying to think who said it, but never leave the side of making a goal without doing something towards its attainment. And so it really does start with make one step. Well, I'm going to, I want to get some coaching. Let me call Lauren. So let me at least do that today. Then I'll get it on the books. And it's so important to get the momentum going. So now how does the, the coaching and your individual coaching tie in with the Brave Thinking Institute? Because I know that's a big part of your program yeah. as well. So I was so blessed to randomly, and I don't believe anything is random, but Mm -hmm. randomly get invited to go to this three-day summit that I mentioned in Los Angeles. And it was put on by the Brave Thinking Institute, who at that point was called the Life Mastery Institute. Mm. But they were putting on a three-day summit on dream building. And the founder of that institute, Mary Morrissey, was the speaker. And when I heard that she could, she taught a system for how to help people transform their lives, I was in. So I signed up to be a coach. And that was not a logical decision because remember, I was broke. I, I had low self esteem. But what I, the way I got myself to say yes to starting that new career pathway was simply just realizing that not listening to myself and caving, caving into fear had not worked. It had gotten me nowhere fast. 
And so I decided, you know what, I'm going to take the leap and do this because this is something I really want and I could really see myself doing and I would love it. So I just went opposite and I decided for once to listen to myself. Mm. And so I got certified by the Brave Thinking Institute at their highest level of coaching certification. And what's been wonderful about that is, is learning from the masters. I advocate for everybody. If you want to improve your life, call David, call me, do go with someone who's traversed that journey, at least a little beyond where you've been so that you can start going in the direction of growth Mm -hmm. and to have mentors and coaches that have gone before me who knew it and had worked with clients and had helped people. I mean, that was so priceless. Yeah. That's really neat. And I totally believe you uh, agree with you too about the coaching thing. And we always need somebody that can advocate for us, ask us the tough questions, hold us accountable, whatever it might be. But it's so important. But you just said something else that I was thinking about that I've wondered. I, I've personally thought to myself, there's some just some questions I have about life. I don't think I'm ever going to get the answers to. And mm-hmm. I think I've become comfortable with the answer. One of the answers being, I don't know. And one of them is it doesn't necessarily really, well, it does a little bit to what we're talking about, but it's, I don't understand why people don't take better care of themselves. I, I've just never understood that. There's just mm-hmm. you get this one body and this, so they smoke and drink and do drugs and go overweight. And then this poor little heart's pumping as hard as it can and so forth. But, but you just mentioned something that you went through. And I'm curious if your thoughts about this, because I think it's such a problem in our entire world and that's low self-esteem when people don't have confidence when they have low confidence low self-esteem even low self-awareness it just is problematic and i think when you have high self-esteem everything in your life works so much better so how would you advise somebody that said lauren you're helping me out but gosh i just my self-esteem is in the in the gutter and i really need how would you help somebody to deal with uh, self-esteem issues Yeah. So the first, I think the most important part is understanding how the self-image forms. Mm. Self-image forms in the subconscious mind. That's where it lives. The subconscious mind is all the parts of you that exist within you, but you're not aware of. The memories, the things your parents told you, the things you've told yourself, the the images you've gotten from the media, that all lives in your subconscious mind. Mm -hmm. And there's millions and millions of pieces of information in there. The conscious mind is what we're aware of. Right. I can become aware of looking in the mirror and going, oh, I look so fat in that blouse or something like that. Mm-hmm. But that's just the tiniest tip of what my self-image is made up of. Wow. The most important thing to know about the subconscious mind is it has no accept or reject filter. Hmm. Whatever you tell it, it believes, which is why you can have a very, I'm just using weight as an example, but there's dozens sure. of ways where self-image can come. But this is why somebody who's thin and beautiful, let's say a model, can look in the mirror and become bulimic or anorexic because if you tell yourself constantly, I'm fat, I'm no good, I'm ugly, your subconscious mind isn't going to come in and say, no, Lauren doesn't really want to think that about herself. Mm -hmm. The subconscious mind just believes. The conscious mind is responsible for accepting or rejecting a thought. Mm -hmm. So the first thing I would train someone to do is get dominion over your conscious mind. That's the part you're aware of. Get dominion over that and start start rejecting the thoughts that no longer serve you and only accepting thoughts that bring life, bring joy, bring love. And that's rigorous work because when we've been having stories in our own mind that are not life-giving stories, um, it's it's a 24-7 thing, our brain, you know? Yeah. Um, so I think that's important. I think the other important thing to know is that the self-image starts forming, I think my belief is that it starts forming when you're in utero, because as you can start to hear and the cells and the DNA and all that stuff. But once you're born, forget about that. That's another conversation. But once you're born, you don't, you, you don't know when you're a little kid that you can reject your parents' beliefs, the media's beliefs. And so age zero to seven is mostly where that self-image forms. Mm -hmm. And if you think about a child, for example, I mean, being a teacher, a child who gets ignored by their parents or reprimanded by their parents makes meaning of it. And usually the meaning we make of it is, wow, I'm not so good, or I must be a bad boy, or they don't love me. And when you don't know that you can reject that thought, that's what forms your self-image. And that's why people end up, the question you asked about why do people not take care of themselves? Mm -hmm. Well, if you have a self-image that says, I'm bad, I'm not loved, Even if you're not consciously thinking that thought, if it still exists within you, you're going to treat yourself as such. Yeah, 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 it's so true. And I think it's, it's interesting because you mentioned weight. And I think as, as I look at like people that are coaching so many times, their, their biggest problem is, is sometimes it's weight, but it's also financial, it's relationships, it's weight, it's careers, it's things like that, maybe family. 
But I found it's just so fascinating because I'm always curious, can you take a class that's called Self-Esteem 101 and get an A and then have great self-esteem because you took the class? And I just don't think so. And I know I went through, it was actually about a year ago and I decided I just wanted to be 30 pounds lighter. So I lost 30 pounds, I actually ended up being almost 40 pounds. And I couldn't believe how much my confidence improved. And I thought my confidence was already pretty good, but it just shows there's all those elements. And then also, I think when you mentioned when, the, when we're born and the images that we get are what's fed into our brain, even in utero, as you said, I also think about how I see two people, two parents that are both heavy and the little child is already really heavy. And I think, God, that hardly even gets a chance out of the starting block, so to speak, because right. that's the parents you were born into, or as I like to call it, the birth lottery. Some of us got fortunate yeah. and some of us didn't and so on. But, but I think that's so important. So I, we got to wrap up in about four or five minutes. I had a feeling things would fly pretty fast with you, but I want to go through and hit on a couple of things you said too, as just reminders to the viewers and listeners. Uh, the stay in a pattern of drama. I really like that because I think there's certain people. That's why I said that just all they want to do is complain. My father used to be like that. And one day I said to him, did it ever occur to you that uh, or I said to him, I said, you complain all the time. And he says, did it ever occur to you? I might just like to complain. And then I just said to him, <laughs> I stopped and about 10 seconds later, I said, did it ever occur to you? I might not want to hang out with you then. Because who wants to hang out with somebody who wants to complain all the time? And so I think it's interesting if, if there's certain and I think women have gotten the short end of the stick. I don't think men are too far behind. There's some people that just want to complain, but do nothing about it. You know, and I need to lose weight as they're having the chocolate sundae or whatever it might be. But I think that stay in pattern of drama uh, to understand the nature of fear, I think that was really powerful too. And kind of the, the danger and the unknown, but also for the benefit of the listeners, mention the, I call it the fear speech mantra, the four uh, sentences again. I really thought that was cool. Sure. Yeah. Fear. Thank you for showing up today. Mm -hmm. Your presence is proof I'm on my growing edge. All those things you're warning me about, if they come, I'll overcome. So bye for now. See you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. <laughs> my favorite part is see you tomorrow. I think that's really interesting too. Um, and then this somehow just that devastating event, you're not my dream girl. I, my, from the outside looking in, well I, well, I suppose you're the dream guy. What makes you so special? I mean, I always <laughs> feel like I want to come back and make a comment to him and, and, but that's, that's brutal. I mean, that's really, then I don't love you. And I don't know if I want to be married to you and just to be able to come back from that self and from that situation. And it really shows too, uh, you mentioned motivational and inspirational speaker. And I've said things too, from the stage, like I'm not teaching from some book, these shoes have walked this path. And it's so powerful to be able to show people you've walked down that path and that if I can do it, you can do it. And I think that's such a great model. Uh, Brave Thinking Institute, um, have a vision of where you want to go. I think that's so important in really having that clear vision. And that's why I like that thing about the, the headlights because it never occurred to me, but that's a great example at night. That's all you need to see. And it's even like those uh, previews of coming attractions or something, they show those cartoons and this person steps out to the step before the step even appears. And then the step yes. comes out there and having that faith that that'll be there too. So uh, so one last thing, and then I'm going to get to my, my favorite last question. So just anybody that's looking to coach with Lauren and thinking that, are there any sort of one or two tips you'd say, have this at your ready when we come to talk? that just be able to be able to answer these one or two questions that might help them right at the outset? Yeah, I think that the two questions I ask everybody who's exploring coaching is what is, what is your longing and your discontent? Mm -hmm. If you're not willing to look at where you are, then we can't know where you're meant to go. So being willing in a conversation with me to take a look, and it takes courage to look because we don't want to know sometimes because then we know we're going to have to change it. Right. So the Correct. willingness to look at the things that aren't working and then the willingness to play dress up and dream a little bit. Yeah, if, you're, like if you're just even a little bit willing for that, then we can work together. Yeah. Cool. And I'll help. It, it, even when it's scary, that's the purpose of having someone like me with you is I'll walk you through it. I'll hold your hand. It's right. like the secret safe together, you know? Right. And I, and I like that too. What is your longing and discontent? Because those are both really good words to describe that. What are you longing for? And what are you not happy with? What is the discontent? And, you know, it's like the burr in the saddle or something. You want to get it out of there and you want to be, have a smooth ride or what have you. So uh, that's excellent. And this, I'll put it in the show notes, but for the benefit of the listeners, what is your, how do they reach you? Yeah. So they can go to www dot soul savvy soul like s-o-u-l savvy s-a-v-v-y dot com 
And actually, I believe if you go to soulsavvy.com slash subscribe, you will get a list of my favorite affirmations that I use to support myself through different life struggles. Some Absolutely. of my favorite affirmative statements to start thinking more positively and transforming some of those limits I'm hitting up against. Excellent. That's good. I'll put that in the show notes as well, too. So, so excellent. Well, thank you so much, Lauren. My last question I say for everybody is what is you only get to pick one thing. What's one thing that Lauren Broyer knows today that you would have liked to known at 18 that would have helped you? I would say the number one thing I would have liked to not just know about as a quote, but deeply embody is the only thing, the only limits we have are those we put on ourselves. Mm. I'd heard that quote before. Oh yeah, I know that, but I didn't really know it. Now that I know it, I'm much less afraid because I know if there's something I want to go after, I'm the only one that's holding me back. Only limits we put on ourselves or ones we put on ourselves. That's so true. And I think, I think going and watching motivational speakers and listening to them too, one of the things that they say ourselves is that one of the problems that people have is they don't bring, they don't dream big enough, you know, and it's just that they're, they're too modest in what they want to do. And, and it's what you can, what you can think you can achieve, you can, you could conceive, you can achieve type of thing. And so uh, very, very important. So, well, I would say the thing is, if, if you're dreaming just of what you think you can do, it's not a dream. It's a goal. Yeah. Yeah. That there is definitely a distinction too. A dream is something beyond what you know how to do. Yeah. And you can, and, you, and really to stretch is how you get there. And it's yep. just sometimes that too. So, well, again, thank you so much. And let me just mention to all the listeners, a couple of last minute reminders too, as I mentioned earlier, my podcast is downloaded every Tuesday morning at 5 a.m. on the Transformation Talk Radio Network. It's available on Apple, Spotify, and Google. Please subscribe and give me a five-star rating if you like what you hear. I do appreciate that. And I do know that people are struggling. Lauren and I just were talking about that. And as a coach myself, my gratitude coaching program will give you a coach that fully believes in you and can propel you forward to achieve anything your mind can conceive. I just mentioned that. The support you receive is unmatched in getting you to believe in you and make changes that you've been wanting and needing to make. Whether it's your finances, your relationships, your career, or your life's journey that you want to change, then this is a good program for you. Gaining a complete understanding of your challenges, asking powerful questions, providing guidance, and a very high level of accountability, along with an attitude of gratitude, very important, all combined to ensure your personal success. My four-month proprietary gratitude coaching program is priced at $4,500, and for my podcast listeners, you will receive two extra months for free. Any extra information you need, on the coaching or my speaking or to buy a gratitude journal, you can reach me at thatgratitudeguy.com and also email david at thatgratitudeguy.com. And one last thing, a lot of people like to get my Monday morning message, my video I send out every Monday morning. It's 60 seconds long to get your week off on the right foot. You can just go to your text and you text in the number 22828. That's five digits, 22828. And you put in gratitude guy in the message box and you will receive the Monday morning minute. So thank you so much for tuning in, Lauren. Thank you again so much. I appreciate it very much. And remember, as I always say, be grateful and never quit. So long. Thank you for listening to That Gratitude Guy podcast with David George Brook, where living with gratitude turns what you have into enough. Transformation starts now and you have everything you need to achieve great things. In a world that is constantly changing, there is motivation and inspiration right in front of us, and you can find yours right now. Don't wait. Visit thatgratitudeguy.com to get started living with gratitude today.